Welcome. Uh, I'm John McAuliffe. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee and the director of the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. This is our second program in a series entitled They Who Sang. And it's about the musicians, the singers, the songwriters who were closely, intimately involved with the movement against the US war in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, probably most of those watching are from that era and will know how important music was in motivating and giving coherence to, to our efforts. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us today um, Holly Near, who was one of the principal figures in the later part of the anti-war movement in the Indochina peace campaign. And you'll hear more about that. Um, and went on to an illustrious career as a major singer, feminist singer and, and an activist. Um, you can find bios on the original page, Zoom page, and we will, or not Zoom page, but the blog page, and we will continue to put additional information resources there, including uh, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, the chat is closed at the moment. It will reopen or will be opened when we get to the Q&A portion of the program. Um, and then you can chat away to find your friends and uh, send messages to the speakers. Um, but use the Q&A function to send questions to Holly and Chris and Linda, uh, and then we will have about 15 minutes at the end for them to respond. This is a bit of a hybrid program because of the professionalism involved of Holly and Linda and Chris. They, they pre-did it. Uh, and so what you're gonna see for the first hour and 15 minutes is a, a earlier Zoom recording. Uh, and then after that, we'll have a, a, a live Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly, who will start the showing. I'd say also that all of this will be probably by tomorrow on YouTube, and you can look at it again or share it with friends. So Holly, you're on your way. I'm Chris Matthews. I have the pleasure of being here today with Holly Near and Linda Tillery. Say hello, you two. Hello. Hello. Hi, hello. Hi, hello. Hello. So, Hello, Linda. So first off, Holly, um, how did this project come about, especially uh, this piece on anti-war protest songs? A man that I knew back in the early 70s doing anti-war work, opposing the war in Indochina, John McAuliffe, is doing a, a lot of work at trying to archive that period of time, both the, the policy, the activism, and he wanted to include the the, the music component. And when we first talked, I looked at the list of some of the songs he was considering, and they were the, you know, the ones, the Phil Oaks, the Pete Seeger, the um, Bob Dylan, the, you know, and they're great songs. But I said to him, it's, it's missing a little bit of a component that I would really like to investigate. And one of the reasons that I know we can investigate it with Linda Tillery is that I saw Linda do a show at the Freight and Salvage in in the East Bay, California, uh, Berkeley. And yeah. uh, <laughs> Linda was doing the protest songs of that time, but coming from a black perspective, coming out of the inner cities. And I was so um, informed and moved by it that I thought, we'll just translate this right over as Linda's willing, let's talk about, talk about this. And when I started looking into the, the music, the just one song after another and full of surprises. I think the one that surprised me the most um, was a song that was written by Hal David, who used to write a lot for Dionne Warwick. Mm. And say a little prayer for me. I guess it was written to be from a woman writing to her sweetheart who was in Vietnam. Wow. And these songs just kept bringing themselves forward. And so I think this is gonna be a fascinating conversation and and thank you linda for willing to be part of it 
So Linda, how did your journey begin in anti-war music and social justice music, specifically with an anti-war uh, element? You know, uh, back in the 60s, uh, when I first started singing, um, I went, I think it was my very first concert, and it was a, a benefit fundraiser. And one of the performers on the bill was a, a person named Phil Oaks. I knew nothing about Phil Oaks or any of these people, um, except for this one performer who came out on stage and blew everybody away, uh, a woman, an African-American woman named uh, Willie Mae Big Mama Thornton. And I thought, wow, there, there are um, other Black people involved in this movement, you know. Then I met Richie Havens and, you know, I started to become a familiar uh, with more African Americans specifically who were singing protest songs. So fast forward about 40 years and I put together a band that I call the uh, Freedom Band. And I did my homework, you know, and I, I went back in time and looked at all of this music that was written by black artists um, protesting the war and talking about its effect upon them. Mm. So um, that's the show that Holly's talking about. It was me with the Freedom Band. And it's a concept that, that I really hold near and dear because, uh, you know, even though we had, um, we actually had quite an impact upon the politics of that particular time, uh, it's almost as if uh, white audiences never paid any attention to the music that we had written. Mm. It's just like, oh yeah, it's got a groove, it's got a beat, we can dance to it. But I mean, you know, when you're talking about make me want to holler and throw up both my hands, yeah. I mean, you know, he's not talking about a sexual encounter, he's talking about, you know, the system yeah. crushing yeah. down on him. I think that's such a fascinating component of the, the songwriting element. It, it is so often that because people experience music, um, just with the beat and with the groove sometimes they don't they don't get those lyrics the lyrics are sometimes lost on them um i think it's why sometimes you hear folks who are at a party request a song like fast car which is a really really sad tragic tale but they like the beat and the riff so much they completely lose those lyrics um so that's the really important point that folks so often i mean even myself that dion warwick song it never occurred to me that that was a, an anti-war song it's such a it's such a fascinating perspective to think of it in that context well, that Marvin Gaye record was was really, it's iconic now. One of the songs is called What's Going On. And it can just be a couple brothers out on the street asking each other, you know, what's going on. But really, it's a guy who's been in Vietnam. He's been out of the scene. He's been completely screwed up in the, in the war, both with the alienation and the drugs and the violence and the whatever. And he's all of a sudden plopped home back in Detroit, back in Chicago, and he's kind of asking his mates what's, what's happening. Mother, mother, there's too many of you to cry. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you die. You know we You see, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love and get here today. Pick it lights and pick it signs. Don't punish me. Talk to me so you can see he's asking his brother, you know, there's too many of us dying. Yeah, too many crying. You know, I really recommend, recommend that whole album. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Anybody.
There was um, another song that was put out by The Emotions, a woman singing group, and it was called Gone on Strike. And it was a vow to resist temptation while their men were away in Vietnam. Now, I had, I'd never heard of this song. I just thought, wow, that is, that is great. And then, Linda, you, you sang at your show, James Brown singing, Say It Loud, I'm Black, I'm Proud. And mm -hmm. people might say, well, that's not an anti-war song. But the, the fact is that war, that what you said earlier, Linda, about it's how it affects us and how it affected the economy, both rural and any inner city people of color. There was a, um, I'm going to read this statistic, African Americans were 11% of the civilian population at the time. And yet in 1967, 23% of all combat troops in Vietnam were African American. And yeah. they were accounted for nearly 25% of all combat deaths in Vietnam. So this racism that was going on, the poverty that was going on, the um, inducting of more people of color into the military, and also the need for when unemployment happens, people feel like they can get a job and they can get some training in the military. Um, it ends up having a huge impact on, on the men and women who went to Vietnam and also to the families that were were staying behind. And then when they came back and there was nothing there for them after like putting their lives on the line, what did they come back to? And I think that's where Martin Luther King kind of started making the connection between racism in Vietnam and racism at home. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian to the point where I can say this, but there seems to have been suggestion that when he made that connection is when his life was in danger. Yeah. Certainly... Yeah, I think his life was in danger all along, but yes, definitely. He re he refu received a lot of flack even from the black community, you know, for, for taking that stance publicly. Mm. Um, I think there were, and this is just my opinion, a lot of people who did not want to be drawn into, you know, the uh, Vietna Vietnam War struggle because it was detracting from the uh, civil rights uh, struggle, mm. you know. Um, but but they're connected. What were yeah. some of the songs for both of you that really drove home that that connection to the anti-racism element as well as the anti-war aspect? The song written by Donny Hathaway called "Everything is Everything," everything is everything. Very poignant, you know. Uh, not a whole lot of lyrics, you know. Just um, there's the refrain: uh, "Everything is everything." Yes, it is, y'all. But then he says, I hear voices, I hear people, I hear voices, I can hear people. And he's always, it's call and response. I hear voices, mm, I hear people. And it's got a blues motif and his chords are always pretty jazzy, you know, jazzy blues chords. And it's, it's real compelling because, you know, it, it's, it's almost like primarily instrumental uh, with a with a chorus in the background, you know, but it hits home and it was, you know, er everybody's phonograph during that time was playing that song. And the other song uh, was uh, Someday We'll All Be Free, uh, Donny Hathaway. Yeah. Those two. And See, this context that you're bringing up, that means that you don't have to say very much if you're living in the middle of it. Yeah. Right. It doesn't sound like a protest song or an anti-war song, maybe to somebody who's not living in the middle of it. But I know, say, in lesbian feminist music, you say gym teacher, you have to say no more. I mean, people <laughs> understand what they mean. Or you yeah. can yeah. say something about uh, cats, you know, lesbians and cats and all, you know, like you don't have to say anything else. Well, this these are languages that are, are in community of struggle languages. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm hearing from, from you about the black music is that one didn't have to break it down. Everybody was living it. Yeah. Everybody had somebody who was dying in Vietnam. Everybody had yeah. somebody who was being incarcerated for right. their for poverty that yes. came as a result of money being spent on war and multinational corporations rather than on community. People yeah. knew that. I mean, that didn't have to be spelled out in every song. And um, in the music that I was doing, I had to spell it out a little bit more mm -hmm. because everybody I was singing to wasn't necessarily living the, the life of people who were being affected by war and racism and imperialism. And, you know, I was trying to figure out how to say those things in such a way. But 
you know, I ended up writing a song called No More Genocide in My Name. Not very subtle, if I might look back on it and say. And yet that's what my audience needed to hear. They needed to hear the words. In Rome, in Cape Town and Beirut, San Salvador, Greensboro, Belfast, Manila, and many more. It's a crime. Do we think the fast just right will save the world in time? They try to tell us all, but we've got to tell them no. Tell them that it's a lie. It's one of the many, and we've had plenty. I don't want more of the same. No more genocide. No, 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 no. No more genocide. No, no. Roberta Flack did the Les McCann Eddie Harris song called Compared to What. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it breaks down very specifically in the lyric. And yet, if you only said compared to what, mm -hmm. that says so much if you know the mm -hmm. context you're coming out of. That's right. all you got to say is compared right, to what, right. you know? And so um, I find it really um, an interesting dichotomy that a songwriter has to decide when do I have to be really specific because this is a group of people who need 101 and around this particular subject. And when can I make those references that are much less specific? Um, is there another song, Linda, that you think of that? Oh comes yeah. Out of your... um, most recently, the Bill Withers song, I Can't Write Left-Handed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that one. that's the one that just, it, it just gets me right in, in my heart. I mean, he says, he says it all in that song. I can't write left-handed Would you please write a letter Write a letter to my mother Tell her to tell, tell her to tell, tell her to tell her family lawyer. Try to get, try to get a deferment for my younger brother. Tell the Reverend Harris. Separate from me, Lord, Lord, Lord. I ain't gonna live. I don't believe I'm gonna live to get much older. Strange little man over here in Vietnam. Bless his heart, I ain't never done nothing to He done shot me in my shoulder And the other thing that's important to bring out is that for most African Americans, there is almost always a connection between ourselves and God, you know? He, he's, he's imploring his mother to write to uh, their pastor, you know, and, and, and ask him to pray for me. Um, we carry that with them, with us always, you know, and, and people, you know, uh, celebrate and, and, uh, uh, their, their, their divinity uh, in different ways, but it, it always is, oh Lord, you know, oh Lord, help me, you know. Um, so in that song, I, he I hear it those elements and then this this man j just does not understand why i'm here shooting at these people that i don't know anything about right. you know i don't have anything against them but here i am in the middle of somebody else's stew you know simmering and being shot at 
And he says, he done shot me in my shoulder. Uh, so yes, I have to defend myself, but I don't want to be here. You know, somebody drafted me again, you know, uh, out of racism or some people enlisted because they had nothing else to do. They know nowhere else to go. Yeah. You know, and so all of this in the army. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And that continues. Yeah. The, oh, the, yeah. the lyric where he says, you know, I, I, it's not that I mind being shot at, it's the being shot that gets me. Um, yes. It's such a such a powerful example of what you were talking about, Holly, and as a songwriter, figuring out kind of which angle to go at to try to mm -hmm. induce empathy from an audience that maybe wouldn't necessarily be thinking about these things. Um, this story, this very deeply personal story of a of a person who has lost their arm in war, who has lost a piece of themselves uh, mm -hmm. in war, and who's trying to figure out how to have communication with his mother, but he doesn't know how to write with his left hand, and so he's yeah. needing help. So, yeah. Yeah, that's impactful. That's deep. That's deep. Yeah. There was a, a group called, um, I keep referring to notes because I am of an age that has no more memory left. Um, there was a group that, an Irish hard rock group called Thin Lizzy. Um, I didn't remember their name, but I think you did, Linda, when we were I, talking I did, the yeah. other day. Well, they wrote the hit, The Boys Are Back in Town. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that that was referring to the men who were coming back from war. Wow. That, you know, I always thought of that as kind of the party song, the boys yeah. are down. And then it's a big song in that um, Night's Tale, that movie. Yeah. Know, you've seen that, which exactly. is really fun, fun. And the boys are back in town. They're all coming along in the parade. <laughs> but to find out that, that he wrote that with the tr troops returning home and that, um, I guess, immigrants with green cards in the U.S. in the 1960s were eligible for conscription. And it's estimated that around 2,000 Irish-born soldiers served in, in Vietnam. So this lead singer who's Brazilian Irish living in Ireland and singing in this hard rock band, that, that was the birthing of that song. Wow. And um, I love that if one digs deep in the, the, the sort of cleverness with which people who had to remain, I didn't have to remain part of the popular music scene. I'd already withdrawn from it. And <laughs> after you sing No More Genocide, there's hardly anything you can do to ruin your career. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I do. <Not> over... <laughs> <laughs> but these people were trying to have careers and mm -hmm. figuring out how in the context of that, they could slip in this stuff. And I find it, um, it really, the, one of the other guys from that band wrote a song called Out in the Fields. They're falling one by one mm -hmm. out from the sky. A thousand more will die each day. Death is just a heartbeat away. There's no communication, no one to take the blame. The cries of every nation, they're falling on deaf ears again. And it's, it's kind of a, got a lot of lyrics. It's very wordy. No yeah. color or religion ever stopped a bullet from a gun. Mm -hmm. And um, it's pretty specific, but they're doing it with really loud guitars and screaming, you know. And so, if, like you said earlier, Chris, if somebody's in the bar and doesn't want to listen to the words, all that they can just dance. Yeah. And beat. A little bit of covert activism. Sometimes it takes yes. that. <laughs> yeah. It does. It does. And, and that's not really outspoken. That's such an interesting phenomenon, the idea of how does a song morph or transform depending on who the artist is who's singing it. Uh, similarly to Blowing in the Wind, Bob Dylan's song, of course, and then once Sam Cooke sang it, how it was mm -hmm. received so very differently by so much of the African-American community right. and the community uh, at large. Yeah, that's a great, great example. It, yeah. Sam Cooke's Change is Going to Come. There you go. Is another one that just knocks me out every time. I was born by the river In a little tent Oh, and just like the river I've been running Ever since It's been a long A long time coming But I know A change gonna come it will It's been too hard living But I'm afraid to die I don't know what's up there Beyond the sky It's been a long A long time coming But I know 
that was such an anthem in the black community. It and one of those- is. Absolutely. Um, Sam Cooke, change is gonna come, you know, it's just, yeah. just an important, um, such an important, and Gil Scott Heron's revolution will not be televised. I mean, yeah. that was such a big statement for somebody to say, and that the fact that it actually got played, that people actually were listening to that. Yeah. In the moment in time, I don't know whether that could have happened a heartbeat earlier, a heartbeat later, but in that moment, the doors opened up and they they let that that piece come through. So yeah, extraordinary. And that yeah. one was revolutionary for quite a few reasons of just musicality, you know, for it to be a, a bit more of a spoken word piece than mm -hmm. a traditional, you know, chorus and verse kind of a song. Um, and for it to still be so iconic. So many people use that tagline, uh, but again, don't have any idea about the full context of the rest of those lyrics, the rest of the song. Right. Well, one, one, one of the things that I'm committed to is being stubborn about, <laughs> um, uh, you know, being stubborn and committed to being a voice for um, African Americans who are of a, a particular uh, uh, social strata, let's say. Um, old folks, you know, from the South, who uh, used music and songs uh, for survival. There's a really powerful uh, Dr. King quote uh, in his book, Why We Can't Wait, where he says, freedom songs are more than just clever incantations designed to invigorate a campaign. They there are the go. freedom songs, the shouts for joy, the sorrow songs, the soul exactly. of our movement. Yeah, hmm. yeah, exactly. This is the music that's medicine for us too. Oh you yeah. Know, when you're just hurting, um, grieving, angry, all of the the emotions that are completely appropriate responses to things that go on. There's so many ways in which we need healing, you know. And I I don't I don't view this uh, my approach as using the music as a weapon. It's just I want you to see me. I want you to hear me. I want you to understand that this music is viable. You know, and it is a part of the American fabric, very much a part of it. So as you um, look forward to some of these other movements that are that are now coming up, uh, you know, there's so much activism with regards to climate change and things like that. What lessons for both of you that you have learned uh, during your work with anti-war movement, with anti-racism work, uh, what are those lessons that you can use to inspire people now in these current move movements to kind of try to carry on and continue that legacy of change making? Songwriters who are out there listening, yes, we're, we're talking about the music that came out during the era of Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, but this is, this is a war zone also. Oh yeah. We're in right now and we can learn from the past, I think. I mean, I think there, that's one of the reasons that John McAuliffe is doing this project and putting together documentation of policy and activism. And I went out on a tour with Jane Fonda and Tom Hayden called the Indochina Peace Campaign. It was in the early 70s. And mm -hmm. the, the crux of it, which I had come from a good liberal family and had been anti-war, I didn't understand until I went on that tour. That whole tour was about the economy of war, mm -hmm. about the multinational corporation connection to the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And that these wars make people a lot of money. And that money is our tax money, the money that hardworking people pay that doesn't end up getting routed back into mental health care and doesn't get to child care and doesn't get to better working conditions. It goes into big contracts that are going out to support multiple uh, bases all over the world. And when I worked with the Free the Army, the FTA show, which was also one of Jane's projects, and we went to the Philippines and Okinawa and Japan and Hawaii and uh, and saw our money being used, as you said earlier, Linda, talking about the Bill Withers song, these, to kill people we don't know that never yeah. done anything wrong to us. Right. And yet somebody was making a lot of money off of that. And it's another resource I'd just like to bring to the attention of, of people who are watching this. There's two films, one's called FTA, which stood for Free the Army or whatever other soldiers called it. Some called it fun travel and adventure, which was the big PR thing to get people to enlist. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then the other one is called Sir, comma, No Sir, which is all about the soldiers' movement of resistance, the GI movement. And they basically came down to the point where they said, uh-uh, no, we're not being sent out into the jungle, jungle to kill Vietnamese we've never met before. And mm -hmm. if you as our commanding officer send that, you won't be alive tomorrow. It was called fragging. And, and the officers knew that if they just sent these fellows out there with no protection whatsoever to fight people they'd never heard of, that their own lives were in danger. It's a very radical movement. And people in government over on this side did not want that information to come over to the United States to the people who are paying for this war to know that the soldiers themselves were saying no. Whole ships stopped being shipped out. You know, there was protests all over the place. And the black soldiers were so revolutionary in this film where they really talk about, and they would be put in stockades for doing solidarity handshake wow. because it intimidated their white officer. Mm -hmm. I really encourage people watching this because the, the reason for this conversation among the, except that I'm having a really good time with you too, is to also just remind us in the next generation that we are cannon fodder and when the time comes along that we are meant to be used or we get in the way and we need to be removed that is part of the public policy of the country in which we live mm -hmm. and i can promise yes. you that if january 6th had been a bunch of radical lesbians or a bunch of people of color they would have mowed us down right away oh, yeah right we this, away. yes we know we know this for a fact yes yeah. So in keeping with that, specifically to artists, but also activists, is figuring out how to take the intensity of this, whether it's climate change and racism and class and feminism and gender issues and whatever, and put it, as Chris said, into stories that make us want to lean into those people rather than lean away from them. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, you are... You bring me such peace of mind to know that you were on this planet following following along and leading. Your music is exactly you. as you say. It's so uh, engaging and you figured out how to to bring us in rather than push us away. And it's Thank a you, Holly. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, a whole lot coming from you. My goodness. You got me <laughs> blushing on the Zoom. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. That's another album cover. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> yeah, I see it. So Linda, one of the songs you did at the freight when you were doing the, the protest songs from the black community was um the Nina Simone song. Mm -hmm. Um I just went uh, Mississippi Goddamn. Yeah. Incredible song. Picket lines, school board cops. They try to say it's a communist plot. All I want is equality for my sister, my brother, my people, and me. You lied to me all these years. You told me to wash and clean my ears and talk real fine, just like a lady. And you stop calling me Sister Sadie. My country is full of lies. We are all gonna die and die like flies. I don't trust nobody anymore. They keep on saying go slow. That's just the trouble. Oh, desegregation. Oh, mass participation. Oh, unification. So Linda, what, yes, when did you first hear that song? Oh, I think I heard it like in the last 10 years, you know. Um, I wasn't brought up to be a political person, you know. 
um, I sort of uh, came into my, my social politics by accident. And it was interesting because when I joined my very first rock band, first band, No Rolling Zone, they were all uh, practicing transcendental meditation. Hmm. They were all vegetarians. Um, and they all had a, a social awareness that I, I was unfamiliar with, you know, from white people. Hmm. It just like kind of blew me away. That was my first venture. And that's when I started listening to protest songs in general. Mm. You know, I, I need to be able to come to any place uh, as my authentic self, you know, my true authentic self, you know, lesbian, black, feminist, civil rights activists, you know, musical activists. And I, 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 at this point in time, I mean, I'm too old to get out in the street, you know, chase people, but I still uh, fundamentally believe in those principles that I just expressed. Yeah. Is that well, what you know, to, to Nina's music, especially, especially that song, some of those yeah, same ideals? Yeah, I mean, talk about lyrics. I mean, I was just listening just now and I thought, I remember how hard it was to, to, to learn that song. Mm. You know, it, it, that, that is a hard song to sing. And what's interesting is that it reminds me of Bertolt Brecht. It, it, mm. it, it's, it's, starts out you know very major right yeah and then it goes minor and you know it gets dark and then it goes major again you know yeah. and it's got all these words and the phrasing has to fit in between you know the chord progressions and i remember i was driving myself crazy trying to learn that song yep, um, not easy no not not it's not an easy song to sing i remember seeing her at ucla my first year of college there must have been 1967 and in that particular case uh, angela davis was teaching there there was a lot going on and i didn't know any of it was going on i was going to the theater arts department and somehow <laughs> or other i got a ticket to royce hall to go to this and i think there were five white people in the audience and she came at the at the end she said she was I can't remember exactly how she, but she went into this song. Well, that place went into a, a high state of readiness and revolution right wow. there, led mm -hmm. by her. And if somebody had opened those doors and, and said, here we go, everybody except, I would have gone too. I don't know about the other four <laughs> white people. <laughs> I, I mean, she, this is where one of the many ways that I saw the power of music Yeah, yeah. is that what is it, 1,500 people or something were in that yeah. hall? It was a concert, but it was so, it was a revolution. It was an evening of her identifying and articulating what had been going on in the lives and the hearts of, of people in that audience. And yeah. for some little white farm girl that was there, she was my, one of my introductions to rage. Mm. I came from a family where, if you got upset at the dinner table, you excused yourself and you went into the other room, you know, we mm -hmm. were not mm -hmm. people who yelled at each other. And to have her anger so clear and so, I mean, even watching that video, she must have done that song a million times, her face and her anger and her, oh, geez, there's something that we need to remember about artists, their bravery, one, to sing that lyric, but also just to be on the stage, either leading a, an audience full of people of color or having to sing to white people who are out on a Friday night, you know? It's, it's amazing that she made it through one night after another. I'm just in awe of her, yeah. her bravery. You know, she, she, she kind of sat on the fringe, you know, of, of uh, the black music experience just because she wasn't a traditional uh, pop, you know, uh, singer, you know, she, she was political. And, she oh, and was... your Brechtian reference is so her, her theatricality is, is profound. She could carry a tune. And, and, you know, in, in the, um, the movie, the, the recent movie that uh, uh, got the Academy Award. Summer of Soul or? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. There, there's a song, she, 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 she t takes up a, a, a poem written by a, by a local uh, poet, not, not someone, you know, really well known. And she puts her stamp on it. And it's like, she's so defiant, you know? Yeah. And so I'm not afraid, you know, I'm going to say what I have to say. I mean, talk about role model. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it takes courage to go against the grain. It, it does. does. I think it that's really one does. of the things to bring this around to, to the conversation of Vietnam, which I'm sure our uh, John McAuliffe would appreciate, <laughs> yeah, I'm is sure. that it, take, it took courage to for these black soldiers that I met when I was doing the FTH tour to stand up against the United States military. Uh -huh. And it takes courage for people living in the inner city in Detroit to stand up against the police department. Yes. And it takes courage for a singer like you to go out on the road with an all white, all male band. And it takes courage to, like you said, just go against the, the grain in all the little ways and all the big ways that we, mm -hmm. we do. And I truly believe that the war would not have ended against Indochina. The civil rights movement would not have made the steps that it made. The women's movement would not have made the steps it made without the music. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it, it, first of all, it couldn't have happened without the music because the moment people are challenged, they sing. I mean, <laughs> that's just what happens. They, um, and when I was coming up, I just remember watching the power of this music and saying, I better get myself a toolbox and there better be a lot of songs in there that I can pull out at a heartbeat as needed when it comes along. Because yeah. I, I remember seeing someone say, uh, oh, I have a song I want to sing you. And I said, sing it. Oh, I got to go get my guitar. No, you don't have to go get your guitar. Sing yeah, just it sing the song. song right now, because yeah. otherwise yeah, yeah. when you come back, I'm not here. You know, <laughs> it's, it's being ready in the moment. Yeah. Take it on, whether you're on the Carnegie Hall or on the back of a flatbed truck in the rain mm -hmm. with a megaphone. You better be ready. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. What was that song? The Tempt People Get Ready. Yep. Ah, Curtis, Curtis Mayfield. Mayfield. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And yeah. those songs mean something to people differently. Like somebody who does no context doesn't know what that song's about. Mm -hmm. if you say that line, people get ready. There's a train coming to somebody who has a context for that, and it, right. it can can make their day or break their day. You know, just. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, even the 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 the, the uh, chord progressions there. They're 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 pretty pretty gospely, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know you could be, you, right away, you know, uh, yep. black folks are gonna go uh, whatever you sing about. Everybody together. Right? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm there with you, you know. Yeah. And there's a train coming, picking up passengers from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. Faith is the key. Open the now, doors that and a political song. I don't know what is, you know. Oh, it's a very it's... political song. Well, yeah, when, you know, when Motown actually turned Stevie loose, meaning he, he won his battle for um, his publishing rights, and he was able to um, start writing songs that were important to him. You know, he wrote, think of me as your soldier. Think of me as your soldier. Uh, there's another one. Uh, Didn't he do one called Frontline? Yeah, you got me standing in the front line. Yep, yeah. He had something to say, a lot of it, you know. Yeah. Um, and Edward Starr, my God, what a huge war. war. What is it good for? Uh, you know? Absolutely nothing. Which, you know, that song was, and still is, a major anthem in the UK. I mean, it, it, it was like over the top in England, more, more so than here in the United States. Yeah. And um, just the music of it. I mean, it's such a yeah. punch. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, it's it's like a karate punch, or it's a it's a battleground right the moment that war. Right. <laughs> you know, it's yeah powerful. And, and and even the temptations. Uh, let's see, ball of confusion. You know, um, I, I rem remember remember that song. You know, and it's just like. It's like a train. You know. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, um, you know, Holly, I, I just think it's interesting. It, whatever a person's background is, you know, that's what they, uh, 
you know, are, are drawn to and revert to, you know, and I, I don't, uh, I'm not opposed, you know, to, to uh, uh, soloists, you know, people, girl with guitar, I mean, you got something to say, and that's the way you do it, you know, but, you know, that's not how I do it. Yeah. Well, and can't we appreciate it all if we open up our minds and are willing to I'd like to be at the table with the full smorgasbord, you know what I mean? Uh -huh, I, I, uh -huh. want it, I want it all. I love the music that came out of Nueva Cancion from, mm -hmm. from Latin America. Mm -hmm. Incredible music. And they had to write in code mm -hmm. all the time. You know, the bird flies free from the cage. Well, mm -hmm. that's as close as they could get to saying what they want to say unless they were going to be killed. Right. And they figured out, these poets figured out how to say it without being killed. And there yeah. were... There was a group of dancers at a big dance festival in Chile during the height of the war with, with uh, Pinochet, mm -hmm. uh, dictator. And they, um, it was their time to, to dance. And the women, it's a, the cueca is a duet dance that you do with your sweetheart. And there's a, a scarf between you. It's a very flirtatious dance. Mm -hmm. These women went out with the scarf but without the partner and started to dance by themselves, symbolizing the fact that their loved one had been disappeared. Ah. And so everybody in the crowd knew what it meant, knew that those women out there were dancing alone. And the police didn't know what to do because nobody had broken any laws. Mm -hmm. They could feel the crowd get excited. They went, oh God, you know, something's gonna happen here. But what happened was the relationship between the artist and the audience saying, I know yes. you know, I know you know. Yeah. And I, it's what was so, you know, leaping and making connections, why that title of Meg Christian's album was, I know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the early lesbian albums was, but here in Chile, they, they, then Sting heard that story and he wrote um, the song, They Dance Alone. And when he was doing his international tour, he invited Mercedes Sosa from Argentina to come up mm -hmm. and do it with him. And she wrote the Spanish version. And then when Mercedes Sosa came to California, she and I performed it together. I mean, these connections of one thing hooked up to another, all because of these women dancers in Chile who went out with the scarf without the partner holding onto the other end of it. I get chills thinking about the way in which art works. Yeah. You know, how it miraculously works. But, um, Chris, so, are you finding that there's there's a new anti-war movement with quotes around it? In, oh yeah, in, I mean, know, I think how's, how's I think very going? much, um, especially with the conflict in Ukraine, um, with them being attacked uh, again. You know, the, this generation of folk singers coming together. Um, John McCutcheon uh, wrote a song, I think, with uh, Noel Paul Stuckey. And I think one other person, but then maybe Tom Paxton. A, I yes, think. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and had you know all of the different people come and sing on that and and make a, a big statement, collective statement in that regard. Um, and so many different uh, issues. I think the I say folk music, and I mean folk music in the in the purest form of it, as in music of the people. And mm -hmm. as as we said before, that means all of the people. Um, and so I think very much so the the folk tradition of kind of being there to speak truth to power, to sing truth to power yeah. uh, in the face of so much. I think it's alive and well. I think it's still trying to maintain so much of that fierceness that you two uh, and so many of the artists that we've been talking about in this discussion um, have set forth. Uh, it's interesting. I think the difference between the 60s and the 70s, I hear people say all the time is that that music was the pop music of the day. That was the popular music of the day. Whereas now this is kind of like the, you kind of got to know a guy to know the song and have a friend send you the song. Mm -hmm. I think that's one difference between the two, but I think in, in general, um, artists are still very much concerned with the, the betterment of this planet, uh, with the betterment of this world and are still trying to figure out how to use their art to, to reflect that, to make this world a little better. Could you talk about one of your recent songs that you wrote about uh, that names all the names of people who have been killed in police brutality? Sure, yeah. Um, I wrote a song called How Many More, um, and it's a Black Lives Matter song. And I, I have 
talked about Black Lives Matter in two previous songs, uh, one song that is specifically about Trayvon Martin um, called Don't Forget My Name, and then a song called We Must Be Free that is uh, an interpolation of Roberta Slavitt's Freedom is a Constant Struggle. But with 2020, with George Floyd's uh, heinous murder, with Breonna Taylor, with Elijah McClain, with so many people, uh, just one after the other, after the other, after the other, it just felt like something else needed to be said and that something needed to be said in a different way. And so rather than try to say something that I had already said before, um, it's, it's literally just a witness to the mass, mass number of Black people who have been killed either directly by police or by the policing of Black bodies, um, as was with the case with Ahmaud Arbery. And so the first verse of the song is all people who were 19 and younger who have been killed, uh, verse two, which is twice as long, or people who are 20 to 49. And verse three is all people who are 50 and up, um, with Ayanna Stanley Jones being the youngest person who I believe was eight as the t at the time that she was killed, and Miss Pearlie Golden, um, who is someone's grandma. And so the chorus is what poses the question, you know, how many times must my people ask why? How many times must we watch another mother cry? Um, and it, it hits very differently. I think as a, as a songwriter watching those two songs hit an audience, um, knowing that it's about the exact same thing, hear all of those names and then be asked, how many of those names did you know? And to see them realize that they knew maybe five or six of them it does drive the point home in a very different way. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the gift of the songwriter is sometimes figuring out new ways to have old conversations um, because there is so much of this that we have been working on for so long. There is so much of this that we have been doing and fighting for so long. And yet we still are kind of having some of those same conversations. And so as a, as a songwriter figuring out how can I say this in a different way that maybe will reach someone that maybe the other way didn't reach. Ayana and Anisha, Tamir, Taisha and Trayvon, Michael Brown and Jordan Davis, William Chapman and Laquan, Keith McLeod and Tyree Crawford, Jordan Edwards and Devon, Antoine Rose, Victor Steen, Jeremy Lake and Patterson Brown. How many times must my people ask why? How many times must we watch another mother cry? And if we were you, would what you've done be enough? Would our reactions be as hard on you as yours are on us? Many more marches will it take? How many more days like this until we break? And if you were us, how much more could you bear? How many I can't breathe before you care? I think that songwriters, artists, dancers, filmmakers can give people that aha moment when they finally connect the dots. How has that, how has that been for you two? Have you experienced that when you go into these spaces with audiences who are maybe new to talking about uh, anti-war activism, about anti-racism activism, and then they come up to you at the end of the concert and, and you can see that you've connected a dot for them. How has that been for both of you? Talk to talk a little bit about that. Well, I love connecting the dots. I mean, you know, when somebody has an epiphany, you know, uh, about a social <clears throat> issue, you know, I'm, I'm always happy. But I want to say this because I was thinking this as you were speaking, Chris. Um, one of the issues that I think I want to tackle, with, whether I do it just in writing uh, or uh, through actual singing, is global, the global... Uh, the global assault on black people, people of black descent. Okay. Mm -hmm. I support the people of the Ukraine, but I do not support their racism. You know, I, I don't support the fact that Poland refused to take black people in to their country country. They're taking in all kinds of other refugees. Um, 
I, I don't support the fact that no matter where you go on this globe, that people of African descent are at the bottom of the social realm. You know, that has to be addressed and addressed and addressed. And even on the continent where black people come from, colonialism still exists, you know, uh, and the resources are still being, you know, torn out of the country and sent to other places. Uh, I want to I want to next go there. That's that's where I want to go. Lift every voice and sing till I can have with the harmony of Let our rejoice I said we have to live a life an authentic life you know whoever we are in that moment be that person you yep. know and and i mean yeah it's scary it has been scary for all of us right but at, mm -hmm. at, at different times uh but we're here we're here I'm yeah, and, to talk to you too i've just enjoyed this so much <laughs> it's been what is, it's it's like three different uh, um you know three different points of view on on a similar subject you know we, we all come to it in, in different ways okay two people uh that i knew two young men that i knew who went to vietnam one was uh, a young black man uh who served in the army came back addicted to heroin number two uh, a white man who was the son of a colonel who went uh, to vietnam in order to please his father he was exposed to radiation, came back and died. Uh, number three is uh, we had a family friend who was in the Air Force. And I was, uh, you know, just spewing anti-war uh, rhetoric. And it, it was really uh, put a strain on our relationship because he, at the time, uh, as a, a sergeant in the Air Force, didn't quite understand, you know, what what I was getting all excited about. He had a different point of view. So those three people really impacted me uh, in terms of the war and the effects that it had on people and also the, div the divisions that it could create. You know, that's it. Well, Holly, you once said, I'm selfish. I reach for the world I want to live in. And I believe in leaving our best to our children. Thank you both Holly Neer and Linda Tillery for tirelessly reaching for that world and for inspiring so many to reach for it too. I'm Chris Matthews. It's been my privilege to moderate this important discussion. Uh, thank you so much to John McAuliffe for inviting Holly to put this segment together, uh, which is sponsored by the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, a volunteer group that is striving to lift up and make relevant the successful movement to end the war. Love you all. Well, that was so great talking with Linda Tillery and to have Chris Matthews there. Just um, such a thought provoking conversation. And I'll be thinking about it for a long time. Um, when I first um, went on the FTA tour, the Free the Army tour with Jane Fonda and Troop, and then later on the Indochina Peace Campaign tour with Jane and Tom Hayden, I found that my knowledge about how race and, and war were connected, uh, racism and war, and especially in the first tour, because I had come off the farm. I was uh, one of the peace activists that just thought war was bad. And uh, what I learned traveling down in places where there were US bases was a more sophisticated understanding of the military industrial complex. But because we met with black soldiers and service women while we were there, they added a dynamic that lasted, stayed with me for, and continues to this day to, to stay with me, to help me understand the, the ways in which poor people in our country, particularly people of color, 
uh, get used as cannon fodder. And that's not to say there weren't a lot of white men that were killed as well. I'm not trying to um, pit one death against another. Uh, I was really influenced by anti-war music, Pete Seeger and Phil Oaks and Country Joe McDonald and all of that. But I, I found that the, the songs that really drew me in from a, on a heart spiritual level came from uh, Odetta, came from Buffy St. Marie, came from later on from Marvin Gaye. I, I felt like that connection between uh, war and what was going on domestically pulled me in in a way that I really needed to be pulled in because a lot of the other songs I resonated with as a peace activist, but they were a lot from the point of view of white men who were being drafted. And I didn't, I didn't have that experience. Um, so it was the other songs that really went deep in on a soul level that drew me in and fed me during the anti-war movement in a way that I, I just want to acknowledge and, and remember how important those artists were in those songs. He's five foot two and he's six feet four. He fights with missiles and with spears. He's all 31 and he's only 17. He's been a soldier for a thousand years. He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist, a Jain, a Buddhist, and a Baptist, and a Jew. And he knows he shouldn't kill, and he knows he always will kill you for me, my friend, and me for you. One of the artists that we didn't talk about um, is Buffy St. Marie. She's a Canadian indigenous singer songwriter. And gosh, I think I read somewhere that she's 81 now. It just seems hard, hard to believe. But she had such a, a complex and interesting career. First of all, there it was resistance to her getting airplay. She had to go through all the sort of blacklisty things that took took place to political artists. But she also um, won an Oscar for writing uh, best song for the movie, um, what was it? The Officer and the Gentleman. She wrote that song, uh, Up Here Where We Belong. And so she had this career where she was so deeply involved in the indigenous communities in the Americas and uh, was getting some resistance from commercial radio for airplane at the same time it was was selling out huge concerts and had won an Academy Award. Um, she had songs like um, Now That the Buffalo Are Gone and Universal Soldier, of course, which was such an extraordinary, extraordinary song. Um, so I, I think of her as being a big part of the um, artists who were taking an anti-war perspective in their music. But obviously hers went through an indigenous door. Some of the other artists we talked about went through black and civil rights door. Um, and that just widened my understanding of war, class, racism, and how it affects people internationally and also domestically. Those were, and those songs, I they kept me alive. <laughs> He's the universal soldier, and he really is to blame. But his orders come from far away no more. They come from him and you and me. And brothers, can't you see? This is not the way we put an end to war. Odetta came into my living room when I lived in a little farm town. My parents bought a lot of records and um, her voice so deep and rich. I didn't know women could sing like that. So her voice was very influential, both the traditional folk songs she sang and then the civil rights songs she sang, and the work songs that came out of the slave culture and, um, 
just her presence in the world always was very informing to me and moving. And she, she did a lot of theater and, and film work as well. But when she sang Bob Dylan's song, I mean, Bob Dylan's a great poet, but I would never be fond of, of listening to him because I'm a, a singer, singer person. Voices really matter to me. So Odetta started singing some Dylan songs. And when she did Masters of War, her presence and her voice was big enough to hold the poetry that he had written in that song. And it was like a, a whole novel book, a, a war and a Tolstoy war and peace. It was a huge uh, telling of the story of war. And with her voice and her presence, it elevated the content of that poem. I'm, I'm speechless, but it, she did it. She held it. Now you masters of war You that build all of the guns You that build the dead plane that build the big bombs You that hide behind the walls You that hide behind the desk Just want you to know that I see through your Never done nothing but build to destroy. You play with my world, I get your little toy. Put a gun in my hand. from my eyes and turn and run farther when the fast bullets fly like the Judas of old Mavis Staples is such a um a rock of Gibraltar in the world of music. So when she sings this song about not fighting the rich man's war, because that's not what her light is about, it's so... It's so true, isn't it? I mean, this these wars that are being fought with our money, uh, with our children, with our resources, and destroying people all over the world. And she's basically saying it's you know not it's not what I came on the planet to do. And um, it's beautiful, it's powerful. All in the streets. I'm gonna let it shine on the battlefield. I'm gonna let it shine. See, now I ain't gonna fight no rich man's war. That ain't what God wanna use me for. Killing folk ain't, ain't in my line. Sure ain't no way to let my little light shine. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine on me You can't fool all the people All the time Get together Let our little light shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine 
I remember when traveling with the Free the Army show, we went to Philippines, Okinawa, Japan, Hawaii. Uh, it was in Japan that we took a side trip from what we were doing with the soldiers and went to the Hiroshima Nagasaki Museum. Well, I was undone. I just, I walked outside and I sat down on a bench and I thought, I, I can't keep going up. I mean, it was just too horrific. And I felt so much shame. And um, one of the organizers, Japanese man who was helping organize the tour we were on, sat next to me and he could feel my devastation. And he said, you know, it's so simple, so beautiful. You weren't even alive when the bombs were dropped. So you can't really hold responsibility for that. However, you can work for the rest of your life and however it is you know how to do to make sure it never happens again. Mm -hmm. And that was a very important thing to say to me. I was only 21 years old. I needed to understand how to do this work without being drowned in, in shame, uh, embarrassment, taking on the guilt, the responsibility. Uh, that was a really good good message. And I think young people today must feel similarly overwhelmed, except in many cases don't feel like they were responsible, that it was the generation before them that did all of this. And I would say to them the same thing that man said to me is, whether you're responsible for the environmental disaster or not, the, this is when you were alive. This is when you got born onto this planet. These are the challenges that face you. And every generation of people that come on the planet are faced with a series of responsibilities, of challenges, of traumas, and this one's yours. So to find a way through all of that maze and figure out what is one's contribution in, in their activism and their spirituality and their creativity in their intelligence. So it's, it's a big job, but I found and have continued to find it a rewarding one. And it gives me a, a rope to hold on to as I walk through this thing we call life. I love singer songwriters. I just think it's such a powerful uh, role in life to be able to pay attention, actively notice what's going on, turn that into powerful poetry and then present it back, give people their lives back in a song. And uh, I just finished doing a historic archive about the music that came out of Oakland, California from feminist women, from lesbian feminist women, many uh, multicultural different ages. And in this gallery, it's set up like a gallery. There's a, a conversation room, a listening room, a photo gallery. But there's in the play, the listening room, there are five or six different playlists, each of which have over a hundred songs. And they're all written by singer songwriters and or performed by artists who found the songs that were meaningful to them. And they all have some kind of social change, life-changing substance in them, hundreds of songs. So for those of you who are, are interested in the music of social change, um, I really recommend you go cruise along in this, uh, called becauseofasong.com is where you can find it and go to the playlist and listen to the amazing songwriting and, and performance of these these songs that really tackle who we are as humans in the world. I want to thank John McAuliffe again for inviting me to be part of this because it, it made me think um, and really do a deep dive into the music that came during the Vietnam era, but also after and um, the songs that were opposing war coming from communities of color, and particularly the, the black community, 
Because war is not only about stopping it, it's about understanding the effect that it has on our lives and how it destroys us um, economically, spiritually, in terms of integrity, in terms of resource, in terms of families. And it's been, it's been an honor to be part of it. And thanks to Linda Tillery and to Chris Matthews for stepping in and stepping up. Are we back? <laughs> we are back. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hi. Let's see. I need to try to. There. Crush there it. I am. Hey. Okay. Ooh, that was something. That was yeah, it is. was. That hey, is Linda. Amazing. Where's your hey. picture? Can you get your picture in? Oh, yeah. Hold, hold, hold on uh, uh, just a few seconds. Um, I was well, in transit. While Linda's coming in, I'll just explain so people don't keep asking. Um, I had cancer. So I have cancer hair. That's, that's the explanation. I'm fine. I'm cancer free. <laughs> now, Chris, on the other hand, she's this is got her shared this is purpose. This is the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I love it. Beautiful. I think you may be the only all right. one who's constantly know. lecturing me. Who's lecturing you? My mom is constantly lecturing me. She's like, you know, about your just a little on the side, just a little length on the side. Just like, no, nope, no, nope, this is great. I love this so much. Let's see. I'm looking at some of the uh, questions here. Yeah. Um, That's some really good ones. Yeah, Chris, you should speak up a little bit. You're a little hard to hear. Okay. Okay, we will do. Um. So Chris, maybe you want to take this one on. It says, uh, who are the Pete Seegers, Marvin Gaye's, Joan Baez's, and Holly Nears of 2022? Um, and there are so many. When I reference the playlist from because of a song.com, the the sixth of the playlists is it's called Amplifiers and it's all the next gen. So go there and take a listen. But um, enlighten us a little, Chris, about some of your peers that you're in, enjoying. Uh, yes. Okay. And I will lean in a bit since my microphone is apparently quiet. Um, I would say definitely of this generation, uh, Kashana Armstrong, um, she's who I listen to when I need to get my well fill back up. She is a phenomenal artist um, here in Nashville. Uh, Ray Zaragoza does amazing work. Uh, Grace Pettis, to some degree, actually is touching on some really important issues in her music as well. Uh, Lily Lewis is absolutely phenomenal. Um, Scott Cook, I think, is probably easily like the Woody Guthrie or Bob Dylan um, of, of my peer group. Uh, Joe Jinks is incredible. Of course, Emma's Revolution. Uh, just on and on. There's so many of us. It's, it always flabbergasts me when folks are like, who are the folk singers of today? And it's like, where do you want me to start? Let me just send you a Spotify <laughs> playlist. There's so many yeah. of us. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm trying to listen to you. And also um, somebody says, can you provide a link to the web? Website I mentioned, yes, because of a song.com um, is, is the link. Um, another place to find the support musicians writing today is peoplesmusic.org. Someone put that in. Um, could someone repeat the Oakland singer songwriter archive? Oh, we just said because of a song.com. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Wow, I learned so much from you, Holly, Linda, and Chris. Thanks to everyone. It was wonderful, terrific presentation. These aren't questions, but I'm really enjoying reading them. <laughs> Great and inspiring. <laughs> so grateful to hear from all three of you. Wonderful material. Um, I also recommend the PBS American Masters special on Buffy St. Marie, this person says. Um, someone's saying all eyes on Georgia. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. I think um, <clears throat> that particular race in Georgia means the difference between the Democrats having 51 in the mm -hmm. Senate. Is that is that that's, right? That's nice. <clears throat> um, someone says, uh, how many people are on this webinar? John, you'd have to answer that one. Well, I think we topped at about 187, yeah. which it's the first webinar I've ever done that the numbers continued to grow. So <laughs> that's a congratulations. We've now down to about 170, which as we go into the hour and a half is not surprising. Um, but all of this will be on YouTube by tomorrow and will again probably double or triple as everybody comes back for a second view of this phenomenal, phenomenally deep and enjoyable presentation and also sh shares it with their friends. So this is just the beginning of its lifespan. Oh, good. Well, can you say again where it's going to be repeated? It, we will send out to everybody who registered. We'll get a note with the link on YouTube. Great. I think that the um, where did Linda go? Oh, there you are. Linda, I wanted to just ask you um, in your work with the Cultural Heritage Choir. Yes. How, how <laughs> why are you laughing? Um, and and how, how did that connect to, first of all, I wanna say, if you go to Goldenrod Music, you can find Chris's music, Linda Tillery's music, my music, and the music of most of the people that came out of the, the women's movement and the women working against uh, uh, inequity and racism. It's called Goldenrod Music, and they're a record distributor. So if you're wondering how to get this music, and Linda worked with a group called the Cultural Heritage Choir. And in this interview, while I was rewatching it, you said that you wanted to, to be cognizant of elder people from the South. And so when yes. you were doing your research around Cultural Heritage Choir, what did you what did you find and how did that get put forth with that particular singing group? That's the group that we inserted the song of the Black Anthem yeah. for you all singing. Yeah, with their voice and sing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in the beginning when the, when the group started out, uh, I noticed that there were a, a number of older uh, African-Americans who would come to our concert. And uh, a lot of people would come up to me and say, oh, honey, I haven't heard some of those songs since I was, you know, a child, or my mother used to sing that to me when I was, you know, nine years old or whatever. And I realized that that music was important to them, you know? So the deeper I went into the spirituals and the work songs and things like that, the more excited uh, the elder people would become. And so mm -hmm. I thought, well, I, I really owe it to them. And I owe it also to the children, the, the younger children, to put that music inside their brains and their minds so that in the 21st and 22nd centuries, the music would still be alive. And so in the South, again, uh, a concert we did with some kids from uh, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, we did a, spirit, <laughs> we did a spiritual that had a really uh, a strong, powerful, rhythmic field. These kids, I think they might've been between the ages of 11 and 13, they went to Africa. That's all I can tell you. They, they, they just went, uh, we never saw anything like that. And we, we were talking to each other after the concert was over. Where did these kids come from? They were not from California or Washington. They, they were still connected, you know, really connected. And I asked this one kid, or I asked for a volunteer for someone to do the buzzard lope dance, which comes from the Georgia Sea Islands, okay? This kid named Walter, he came up, he took the cloth and he did the buzzard, I mean, 
talk about bringing tears to my eyes. I, this little boy just, and he wasn't ashamed, you know, because sometimes 13 year olds, they get embarrassed around their peers. Walter didn't give up. You know, he just went for it. So mm-hmm. that was a profound experience for me. I, I will never, ever forget it. And I will mm-hmm. never forget also going to Spelman College to do a residency because what I learned there and saw there just, um, let's say, brightened my life. Mm-hmm. It really I did. love hearing that because I think sometimes people forget that artists have to go and get educated and inspired and lifted up and it it can refocus everything you're doing by having that kind of an experience so thanks for sharing that story yeah. someone here says um wanted to know where sweet honey in the rock fits into this picture and um chris you want to talk about that and what that influence yeah. for you has been <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely uh ella's song is probably the song that has been most influential to to me um probably as a writer i remember seeing sweet honey in the rock uh, come to my college and just being absolutely blown away and just floored by them and have been a fan ever since i think the they are absolutely um among some of some of the greats in, in the genre, when we think of anti-war, when we think of anti-racist, um, when we think of activists, when we think of artivist, um, Sweet Honey in the Rock is absolutely up there. They have done incredible work and continue to do um, absolutely incredible work uh, with their music and with their artistry. Yeah, it started with Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan when she, her first record that's out there, Give Your Hand to Struggle, is an extraordinary record of her singing a cappella with just her shake array. And um, then later she started, um, I think it was a workshop, um, helping people learn how to do this kind of singing that she was doing. And that out of that came the five singers, I think it was a Sweet Honey in the Rock, but kept that workshop going so that if ever there was someone in Sweet Honey that couldn't be there, they had someone ready to step in. And I, I'm not telling this story very well, but the point of it and the meaning of it to me is to remember that we have to let people shadow us. We have to let people learn from us to stay close by and watch um, how it how it goes, even if it's just letting some people come to a sound check and watch how the sound check goes, you know, how we pass on years and years of experience and mistakes and knowledge and heartbreak. Um, because it would be too a, bad for all that to go to our grave. What, Chris? Absolutely. I actually got um, a text message from Lily Lewis that says, if you get a chance, tell Holly, I was singing with the Feminist Women's Chorus in Atlanta when she guest uh, taught over two decades ago, and it changed my life. Dropped out of my music <laughs> department because singing with her made me break up with misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what a good breakup. That's great. <laughs> Oh, somebody here in the uh, questions, Chris, I feel like there's a lot of conscious rap like Nas and Tupac. Shouldn't they also be recognized as activists? Absolutely. 100%. I'm like, I don't know why I'm being asked that question. You've obviously never seen me teach a class on social justice music. (laughs) (laughs) There's like a whole subsection on hip hop and (laughs) R&B. And where do people find your schedule, Chris? How do people find, find you? Uh, I'm I'm pretty much Chris Matthews everywhere on the internet. You just have to spell it right or you'll end up at the yeah. hardball website and then there's no helping you. <laughs> so. oh, then somebody asked, where can I find the recording? Hang in there. Um, on my website, hollyneer.com, or as I said, at Goldenrod. We reissued all the old ones. They're now, they're now on CDs. So um, all of those early recordings that were just on cassette and record are now on CD. Somebody shouts out uh, Ronnie Gilbert, uh, how much they appreciated her work. Um, Let's see. I think that's, I think I've gotten to most of the questions. John, is there anything you wanted to say to wrap up? I'll end up a couple of things. One is to thank the three of you. I mean, Holly is an old friend Mm -hmm. and easy for me to introduce. Um, Chris and Linda are new friends, I hope, because this has been an extraordinary I watched it in when I first got it and to see it again a second time is why I said that I think a lot of people are going to go back and watch it 
a second or third time because there's so mm -hmm. much that the three of you put in there. And Holly, your postscript just broadened the field even more. And, and so I appreciate everything you did. I uh, also should thank <laughs> especially Holly and Chris and my two sons, John and Liam, for technical support. They got this all <laughs> online at the right time and functional. So well, um, you're a very brave man to take it on, John. You're a brave man. It's, uh, it's great. good. Uh, we, when we send out the link, we'll also send the link for the program that Peter Yarrow and Reggie and Harris and Sunny Oaks did a couple of weeks ago. And oh yeah, let me just tell people sure. what that was. It was the the first the first one of these getting together with artists and talking was done with Peter Yarrow from Peter, Paul and Mary, um, Sunny Oaks, who was Phil Oaks' sister and has kept Phil's music alive all these many years. And Reggie Harris, who's a social change activist, singer, songwriter. Um, they did the first conversation. And um, with, uh, oh, I'm blanking out, John, who was the moderator? Oh, it was Heather Booth. Heather Booth, Heather right, Booth. long time right activist. Now. Right. And um, then there's this one, the three of us, and I don't know if there'll be others, but oh, there what definitely I would encourage, will be. We certainly I hope, so. yeah. hope that Buffy St. Marie will be one of them, and Joan Baez will be part of it, and Judy Collins, and uh, we. The more this grows, the more people we discover that yeah. we want well, to try. Well, also and, just to say to people listening at home is that you don't have to wait for us to do it. Right. You have your own living rooms, you have your own music clubs and venues in your communities. You can look around and discover who who is in your town that maybe you know and who is there that you don't know. Like you have to go look for the people you don't know. Um, and, and we don't pop out of our garages when we're 13 and everybody knows us. We have to be found. And um, it takes a take some doing to go and see who you live with. Right. So I hope that this um, particular webinar has inspired you from the things that Chris and, and Linda were saying about um, their perspective, the doors that they walk through, the three of us walk through really different doors um, and you have to go look for it, you know, and in order to, and then once you found it, I mean, I'm so grateful that I've been able to spend most of my adult life knowing you, Linda. I mean, you have been such an anchor in Oakland and such a good friend and such a teacher. And there's been enough Easy. trust between us that if I made a wrong step, you weren't afraid to say, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and it was, it's been great to build those kind of relationships where we can have an honest conversation about racism and sexism and music and stage fright and, you know, all those right. things. Oh, yeah. And, and where to put place your microphone and, and where to get rid, how to get rid of the stand and all that sort of thing. And yeah. you know, uh, I, I wanted to add to this. It just occurred to me that, that there's a song that I wrote that should have been included in here, that's Freedom Time. I don't know why it didn't come to mind. I, I let that slip by. I let that slip send by. Send me the link and it will go on the blog page and people can find it. All right. Okay. Well, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. It's now, actually on one of the playlists of becauseofasong.com. I did put Freedom Time great. in there somewhere. Um, okay. But and Chris, I will say that at the when we were finishing up the program with Peter, talking about that. who are the musicians of this generation, your name was mentioned. <laughs> um, yes, yes, very it was. flattering. Very, you, very you have, flattering. You have been anointed. <laughs> you have to carry on all of this as, as we pass on to greater glories. Okay. It is an, is an absolute honor to even remotely attempt to fill those incredibly, incredibly powerful shoes. Well, you also mm -hmm. did a great moderating job. So as I yes. was taught by my sister, we do a family Zoom every week, and this is how it ends with everybody hugging each other. And then yeah. Peter, Peter taught us two weeks ago that you should reach out. And when you're, especially when you're like this, and your hand is reaching somebody else's hand. <laughs> That's really lovely. I love that. It's so beautiful. All right. So Thanks, everybody. Be well. Good holidays. Peaceful. Yes, good, yeah. good holidays. Thank Much you. love. All right. Yeah. We'll love. We'll be following up by a message tomorrow, and uh, hope to you'll be able to join our next program. Bye bye. Okay. Someday we'll all be free.
That's so right, Linda. Love you. Love, love you, Chris. You too. Love you both. So great to see you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.